Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor Series sponsored by MRI Education Foundation. And we're going to continue our vignette series with hip pathology and specifically impingement syndromes where we've covered to date CAM1 and CAM2 impingement syndromes. But we'll continue on with that theme showing you some miscellaneous impingements and show how they can weave into CAM1 and CAM2 impingement. And at the end, we'll even summarize CAM1 and CAM2 impingement. Let's begin with femoroacetabular impingement of intrinsic nature. What do we mean by intrinsic nature? There is something, an abnormality inside the joint that can lead to altered joint biomechanics. In other words, when you flex your leg, perhaps there's a body inside the joint that lessens the room in the joint and forces the femoral head more superiorly than it otherwise might have gone. This can also happen with applica or alterations in the ligamentum teres, too much acetabular fat, and any other structure in the joint that doesn't belong. For instance, pigmented villonodular synovitis can do this as well. Here are some osseous bodies seen over the lower neck of the femur on both an oblique and an AP radiographic view. The MR slices taken with water emphasis and fat suppression show a structure labeled B sub zero, standing for body. A body is located in the joint space. Now, how do we know we're in the joint space? Because a line drawn from the medial capsule to the lateral capsule represents the zona abicularis, the area where the vessels perforate the joint and provide blood supply, and also define the intraarticular space above and the extraarticular space below. So our body resides in the intraarticular space, making matters more challenging in the hip flexion internal rotation position is the presence of a bump and assist that are pressed even further and earlier against the anterior acetabulum in flexion and internal rotation because the body is pushing the femoral head superiorly, exacerbating the situation. And eventually, the labrum tears and an erosion or marginal erosion ensues. Hip dysplasia. Hip dysplasia is something we think about in the neonate. The child comes out, is uncomfortable after several days or weeks in the nursery. They are delayed in their ability to ambulate. And eventually, they get an ultrasound that shows an abnormal relationship between the acetabulum and the femur, or the child has an abnormal click on physical examination, the so-called ortolani maneuver. But individuals that escape detection of hip dysplasia and go on to young adulthood may then present as impingers. And there are many different manifestations of this dysplasia, some of which may overlap with CAM1 and CAM2 impingement. MR is used in the neonate very selectively for hip dysplasia because ultrasound is so good and physical examination is also quite good. But when a child does not respond to the conventional therapies, like a cast harness, or the hip will not properly reduce into the acetabular cup, you may need to go to MRI. And certainly, in the adult presentation of impingement due to dysplasia, and you know that some dysplasia exists because you've taken an x-ray, then you go to magnetic resonance imaging, which is radiation free to evaluate the status of the hip in this young person. Now, some of the things that can persistently alter the biomechanics of the hip, even with proper attempts at therapy, include hypertrophy of the fat in the joint, so-called pulvinaric fatty hypertrophy, enfolding and scarring of the capsule, Deformity 
and infolding of the labrum or limbus, foreshortening and contraction of the iliopsoas tendon, a vascular necrosis, loss of cartilage or chondrolysis, and very large effusions, which sometimes in themselves may have to be aspirated. Here's an ultrasound of a young child or neonate. It shows the femoral head, the acetabulum, and the limbus or labrum covering properly the femoral head out to its lateral margin where the femoral head then begins to fall off. In the upper right is a patient who has had a failed cast harness procedure to reduce a dysplastic, deformed, femoral and acetabular relationship. The femoral head is uncovered. In other words, the acetabulum is not sitting above it. The femur is all the way out to the side, somewhere on the east coast, while the acetabulum remains on the west coast. And even with a cast, pressuring the femur in, there's not enough acetabulum to hold it, and there is capsule that is now scarred and folded into the joint, preventing its reduction. A lot of useful soft tissue information from MRI. One way to assess the relationship, the conformity, the congruence, and the coverage of the acetabulum relative to the femur is via the congruence or coverage angle. A horizontal line is drawn perpendicular to the vertical. A second line is drawn from fibrocartilage rim to fibrocartilage rim. This angle should be about 40 degrees. If the angle is too small, there may be over coverage. If the angle is too large, there may be under coverage. Let's show you an example of developmental dysplasia of the hip in a young adult. In other words, dysplasia that escaped detection in the neonatal period, and even in this case in the infant period, and made it into young adulthood. This patient was born with a short, flat, squat femoral head. A short, flat, wide femoral neck. The acetabulum is very vertical. It doesn't have a lot of coverage. In an attempt to cover the femur during this patient's young life, it's a woman, by the way, the acetabulum has hypertrophied, a combination of bone and fibrocartilage. But that's not good enough to hold the femur stable and to prevent her from having pain. So she's essentially undercovered with a dysplastic head, a dysplastic neck, and a shallow acetabulum. We'll also want to check for some of the other more classic findings that we see in FAI, or femoroacetabular impingement, like antiversion, where the back structures, the back wall of the acetabulum is overdeveloped and pushes the femur forward and rotates it forward. Or retroversion, where the front wall of the acetabulum is overdeveloped and it pushes the femoral head backwards and rotates it backwards. Most of you are familiar with the phenomena of coxa vera and coxa valga from conventional x-ray. And then you've got the old scars from a Salter Harris 1 injury and in slipped capital femoral epiphysis and from generalized old fractures, which may leave a linear low signal scar forever. There's a patient with DDH, developmental dysplasia of the hip. There is a large labral tear that we can see anteriorly in this axial fat suppressed sequence with multiple small cysts in front of it. There is also a macerated posterior labrum with a larger cyst associated with it. Are these two connected? You bet they are. We just have to go up a little higher. Up a little higher, we see that the tear goes all the way from the front all the way to the back with multiple small cysts. This is typically what you see with repetitive trauma 
in patients with CAM, but especially in patients with pincer impingement progressively over time. So let's summarize. Let's summarize classic CAM impingement that we talked about in the early series of these vignettes. Let's look at it dynamically. There is a bump. There is a broad, non-tapered femoral neck. In flexion and internal rotation, the bump abuts the anterior acetabulum and creates a bruise, then a tear or an erosion of the anterior acetabular limbus or labrum. The underlying bone and cartilage then become affected and eroded. This erosion may then progressively extend from anterior to posterior for quite a variable distance and may involve almost the entire acetabular rim over time. Let's look at pincer type impingement. This time the femoral neck will not have a bump. It will not have a cyst. It will stay tapered. The problem is in the deep acetabular overdeveloped cup so that when the patient goes into hip flexion and internal rotation, it is the cup that rakes against the neck of the femur and creates an elongated damage zone. Because the anterior aspect of the acetabular wall is overdeveloped, it pushes the femoral head backwards. So not only is the injury anterior, it is also posterior, creating both a coup injury in the front and a contra coup injury in the back. And this may involve the entire femur and the entire acetabulum from anterior to posterior, creating a very profound injury pattern. So this summarizes at the very end the two classic forms of impingement. And prior to that, you've seen some variations that may either exist on their own or exacerbate these forms of impingement. Thank you very much and have a great day.